Hey guys, um, I hope you're doing well this Sunday um, and I hope you're staying safe. Uh, today on our bed talks, we're gonna be doing a problem solving session, actually. So I'm going to, I have my worksheet in front of me that I've kind of been handing out. And we're gonna go over some problems from that, hopefully about three or four problems, to maybe show you some problem solving techniques um, and, and to kind of show you how to actually utilize the stuff that we've been learning in the last couple of sections here, especially for 14.4 to 14.6. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do basically a one problem from each section. So this gets you on spurring kind of how to do some of these problems that I think about them and how I would kind of go about them. So the first one we're gonna do is from section 14.4, which is about tangent points. Um, and it's actually, if I'm not mistaken, problem number uh, 2B on here. Um, and, and the problem basically says, I have a function f of x, y is equal to x e to the x, y. And I am attempting to find my linearization um, at the point, um, if I'm not mistaken, the point is, um, this is one zero. I want to find the linearization at that point and then approximate what the value of f at 1.1, negative 0.1 is. I want to approximate this value. So I want to find the linearization. So again, what is the idea of linearization? The idea of linearization means that I am trying to find an approximation close to the point 1,0 on this surface. Um, and I'm trying to find, you know, a plane that approximates it near that point. Right, the, my, my goal here, the linearization aspect, is just trying to find a tangent plane. I'm trying to find a tangent plane. So the two things I'd usually need for a tangent plane, um, you know, I need a normal vector and a point. And this usually comes out of that way. So the interesting thing is, and there's a really nice formula if I have something of f of x, y here, um, my linearization usually comes out to be L of x, y. We can consider this as a z almost still. It's consider, consider a z. So L of x, y is gonna be equal to f at my point one zero, I need to have my function value at one zero. I then what I could do is I'm gonna take the partial derivative of this function with respect to x at one zero and multiply it by x minus one here, kind of like that. And then I have fy at one zero and y minus zero. So three things I do need. I need to find my function value. What's the height of my function at the point? What's the height of this kind of surface? And I'm going to try to find that. And then I'm going to try to find the derivative with respect to x and the derivative with respect to y. And then I multiply these together and I get my, my function. You can kind of think about this as well as kind of a z too. So this kind of looks like a plane, right? Z, x, and y, and it's just linear combinations of that. Now, where does this actually come from? Well, I'll kind of maybe show you a different method to kind of use in the future so you don't have to do this over and over and over again. This kind of memorize this because I don't really like this idea of memorizing. Um, so what I would suggest doing instead, if you don't want to go ahead and do this in this method, which you could just do the derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, and all that, what I would suggest to do is the following. You can say this is equal to z. Here, you say this is equal to z. And what we can do instead is I, so I have z is equal to x e to the x y here. And what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to move over the z. I'm going to zero is equal to x e to the x y minus z. Now, if you note here, right, this is now a function, I'm going to call this big F of x, y, and z. I know for a fact now that I have this service, I now have a function f of x, y, z, which is equal to zero. It's kind of a level surface, right? This describes a surface, describes this exact surface. Now, what I know for a fact, too, is the equation for a tangent plane which is, a, again, the idea of a linearization here, could be just to calculate the gradient of this function f at my point x0, y0, z0, and take the dot product with x minus x0, y minus y0, z minus z0, and that's equal to zero. I know my normal vector to a tangent plane is, in fact, the gradient. So what I could do then is I could just take the gradient of this function and evaluate it at my point. Now, a couple of things you will definitely try to need. You're going to need one zero. I'm going to need an OZ zero. So if I plug in one zero here, just as kind of a reminder, F of one zero here, plugging this in, I will get my Z coordinate. And this could be one E to the zero, which is just equal to one. 
So this means that I really have a point one, zero, one. I'm somewhere on my surface at one, zero, one. Now, what's going to happen is I'm going to now take the gradient of this function. The gradient of this function is not too bad. This first part is going to have to do with, with respect to x, with respect to y, and with respect to z. So the derivative of this function with respect to x is, is going to, I'm going to have to use, um, you know, uh, product rule here. So this is going to be e to the xy plus x y, the derivative with respect to um, x of this top function is going to be y, so the y is going to be brought down, e to the x, y. The derivative, and then the z goes away because there's just no, there's no x there. The derivative with respect to y is, again, here, it's just going to be x squared now, e to the x, y, and the z goes away. And then if I take the derivative with respect to z, I then get a negative 1, it's something like that. And so now what we do is I find my gradient at the point one, zero, one, which will be my normal vector for my plane. And doing this here, I can find that if I plug in one, zero, one, this would be then e to the zero plus zero, because this y here would be zero. I would then get here um, e to the zero again, and this would be negative one. So if we note here, this is just going to be one, one, negative one. And this right here is my normal vector to my plane. That's kind of my goal. Now I have that. So this is my normal vector to my plane. I now what I do to figure out my linearization is I now find the dot. I now just use this normal vector and I just evaluate as I would. So with that in mind, I'm going to go from here. Do, 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 do. You can go ahead and do this any way you would like. You can go ahead and memorize that other formula. It's going to do the linearization here um, and, and kind of as a shorthand. But you will always get a negative 1 for this um, um, z component for a normal vector if you have something of the form z equals. And it's actually a little bit easier, I think, to write it out in this way because you don't have to memorize everything over time. You just know that if I put everything to one side, I find the normal vector just by taking the gradient. And you can just go from there. So what we do now is if I want to do a minus x minus x0, x minus minus a, x0 and all that, I would get 1 x minus you know, 1 plus 1 y minus 0. And I would get minus a minus 1 here, z minus 1 is equal to 0. Now, in this case, if I want to approximate f of 1.1 negative 0.1, I'm going to have to get z by itself because z here is f of x1. So I want to at least approximate that. So we can try to move things around a little bit more. So this becomes x minus 1 plus y minus z plus 1 is equal to 0. And if you know here, the, these cancel, and I'm left with z is equal to x plus y. So now, why do we like this a lot more? Well, if I wanted to approximate now f of 1.1, negative 0.1, instead of me plugging in 1.1 and negative 0.1 up to here, which is going to be a little bit weird, like e to the negative 0.1 times 1.1. That's a weird number. I don't really know a lot about exponentials other than some really easy ones. Um, so it would be just a lot better for me to use this tangent approximation, because this point, 1.1 negative 0.1, is very close to 1, 0. It's very close. So what we could do then is if I want to approximate this, but I can consider this as maybe my linearization now, L of x, y. If you use the other formula, you'll get the same exact thing. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug in, you know, L of 1.1, negative 0.1. And this is actually much easier to calculate because this is just 1. So basically this says this is approximately 1 around this point, 1.1, negative 0.1. And this gives me a pretty good approximation. If I'm not mistaken, it actually gets pretty close to this. So the process usually is, if you want to find the tangent plane, just a tangent plane in general or a linearization just in general, um, what you should do is you need to calculate the derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to y, and the function value at that point, right, at, at, at that height. You can use that formula that I brought up in the beginning. Right, pretty nice, pretty simple. You can kind of go ahead and do that. Or if you don't want to memorize that, you can always do this exact method, where you put all of the, co all of the constants, all of the variables onto one side. You then take the gradient of that, um, of that function evaluate it at that point that you're trying to find a linearization of. 
And then from there, you kind of go down. If you're trying to find and approximate something that looks like this, you want to get Z by itself. So that, that would be your linearization. If not, you can just leave it as, you know, just a regular plane and then evaluate what you need to there. That's kind of what you should do here. Um, yeah, so there's like many different techniques you can use with this. There's usually two of these main ones. Um, I usually like to do this so I don't have to memorize it this one. Okay, that's kind of the idea of 14.4. Now, for 14.5, the chain rule, let's do a problem from there. So I have the chain rule here. I'm going to be doing a problem. I will do problem number. Um, yeah, I will do problem number three here. So this is where I have you. So this is problem number three. Problem number three. And I have that u is equal to x to the fourth y plus y squared z to the third. And I'm told that x is equal to s e to the t or set y is equal to r s r s squared e to the negative t and z is equal to r squared s sine of t and i would like to find d u d s if i'm not mistaken yep when r is equal to 2 s is equal to 1 and t is equal to 0 is that correct yes it is great and so this is my goal. My goal is to find du ds when all this happens. Now, this is a lot of information there, a lot of stuff. So let's just kind of review. I have my function u. It's a function of x, y, and z. I then also see that x, y, and z are changing with respect to three other variables, r, s, and t. And I want to see how this function u changes as I move s, as s moves there. So you can just imagine, let's let r and t be constant. Right? Let's let r and t be constants. If I move s, how does this affect this whole thing? Now, what I would suggest doing always for these problems um, is to draw out your tree diagram for this as best as possible, because it usually helps you out try to visualize what's happening here. Because u is being affected by x, x is then being affected by s, in, almost implicitly here, so a certain way. So we can kind of see that I have u here. u has three variables, right? u is with respect to x, respect to y, and with respect to z. We also see that x is, is, is dependent on s and t. We see that y is dependent on r, s, and t. And we see that z is also dependent on all three of these variables here. So now, with this in mind, right, with this in mind, how am I going to try to go about this problem? I, I need to find all my variables that are with respect to x s here. So now what I'm going to do is I see, okay, this is with respect to s, this is with respect to s, this is with respect to s here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw circles around every place that I see um, an attached branch all the way up to you um, that is dependent on s. So I see that x is dependent on s here. And I know that x, u is dependent on x. I also have that y is dependent on s, and also u is dependent on y. And lastly, I know that u is dependent on z, and z is dependent on s here. And so what I would always like to do, if there's any ever any overlap in, in this kind of area over here, especially in this middle column, you always want to have a multiplication in your chain. Right? That's kind of the goal. So what is this saying? This is saying that if I have du, ds. This is going to be equal to the following. Well, u is dependent on x, right? And I know that x is dependent on s. Now, note the overlap here. So I'm going to have d, uh, dx ds. So u is dependent on x, where x is also dependent on s. You can kind of see that if I, if I did horrible, horrible, horrible um, multiplication, these dx's cancel, and I'm back with du ds. That's what you should always have. Now, I also have this with respect to y and with respect to z. So I need to add the contributions together. So this becomes du dy multiplied by, because I have this overlap, dy ds. And lastly here, I have that u is dependent on z and z is dependent on s. Now, note a couple things here. 
I have to use partial derivatives for all of them. And why is that? Well, u is dependent on more than one variable. So I have to use partial instead of using d. I also know that x, y, and z are also dependent on multiple variables as well. And so therefore, because they're dependent on multiple variables, I also have to use that. Now, if I only had one variable per each, I would then use just the dx dt because I only have one variable, so I don't have to tell the reader or somebody else that you know, I'm being dependent on multiple variables here. So what I now need to do, that's what I'm gonna do right now, is I'm gonna calculate all of these. I'm gonna calculate du dx, dx ds, du doi, dy ds, du dz, dz ds, and then I know I'm gonna calculate it at this very, very exact point, which we'll talk about in two seconds. But the first thing I need to do is calculate all these values. And this geometrically or physically is really saying, as I move S and keep R and T constants, as I move S in the positive S direction, for instance, S is one here. So as I keep R two and T zero, as I move S going to two possibly, right? How fast is my U changing? Okay. So let's calculate all of these. And it's going to be a little bit more tedious, but this is going to be the idea. You always want to draw out the schematic. It's very, very helpful. I always do that. Um, I still do it with the chain rule and, and research and all that. It's pretty, pretty, very helpful. So with that in mind, let's kind of go for it here. So, so du d, uh, ds is going to be equal to, the first thing I had was the partial of u with respect to x which is just 4x to the third y. This guy goes away because there's no x dependence. And then I multiply it with dx ds. So the derivative of x with respect to s is just e to the t. Okay. Next, the derivative with respect to y of u is y to the fourth plus 2yz to the third. x to the fourth, sorry, x to the fourth plus 2y z to the third. The derivative of now y with respect to s is 2rs e to the negative t. 2rs e to the negative t. And lastly here, du dz is just 3y squared z squared. And then multiplied by dz dt, dz ds, which is equal to just r squared sine of t. And this is the derivative with respect to s. Now note here, I have a lot of variables. I have actually oh, six variables here. x, y, and z, which are dependent on, which u is dependent on, and r, s, t, which x, t, and, um, x, t, and, uh, x, y, and z are all dependent on. So now I want to find what this value is at this specific when r is 2, s is 1, and t is 0. Think about these as maybe times or different variables that are changing. So what am I plugging for x, y, and z, right? What am I plugging for those? Well. I know x, y, and z are all dependent on r, s, and t. And so I can find out what x is at this, these values, what y's are at these values, and what z is are at these values, just by plugging them in. So if I plug in x here, s is 1, so it would be 1 e to the 0, because t is 0. So this becomes just 1. This is when x is equal to 1. How about y? Well, y here is r, s squared e to the negative t. So it's 2 times 1 squared plus z, e to the 0, which is 1. So this is going to be 2. And lastly, z here, we said this could be r squared. So 4 times 1 sine of 0 is 0. So this becomes 0. And so whenever I see anything in here, these are the values I plug in. Anytime I see x, I'm going to plug in 1. Anytime I see y, I'm going to plug in 2. Anytime I see z, I'm going to plug in 0. r is 2, s is 1, t is also 0. So let's do this. Very, very long here. The first one here, I have a four. This is going to be times a one times just two e to the zero, because t is zero. This guy right here is just going to be one plus zero, because z is zero. Over here, um, I'm going to have just a two times. 2 times 1 times 1. And lastly here, z is 0. So this goes away. 
this entire thing goes away. <laughs> entire thing goes away. So z is zero, and also sine of t is also zero, because t is also zero. Okay, so that's it. And now we see that this is going to just be eight. This here is going to be four, and so therefore their answer is twelve. And so with du ds, what does that mean? That means as s moves and r and t stay constant, as s moves in the positive s direction, whatever that means, whatever that means, as I move in the positive s direction, um, this means that u, this function u, is going to be changing this height. It's going to be changing at a rate of 12. So the slope of that tangent line is 12, and whatever that really means um, in terms of this chain rule. That's kind of what we do here. Techniques. Draw your schematic. Write everything down, making sure that you have multiplication um, if you have those intermediate steps. And lastly, if you're trying to find what x, y, and z are to be, or what your variables have to be, if you have to plug in something, make sure you use your, you know, your t, your s, and your r, and plug that back into here to get that value. Okay, that's the idea, the idea of chain rule. It works very similarly to what we've done in uh, Calc 1. It's a little bit more complicated now because we have so many more variables, and this can extend to like, infinitely many variables, really. Should always be careful with infinite. I'm not too sure about that. It probably does. No, it does. It definitely does. Yeah. Okay. Now, last thing we'll do is talk about partial derivatives, uh, directional derivatives, and how to do a problem like that. So what I'm going to tackle here is I'm going to amend one of the problems a little bit. Um, yeah. So I'm going to amend um, a problem 4a for a second here. I'm going to do problem 4a on 14.6. So 4a. Math is kind of my 4a. Sorry. I'm sorry. So we'll see. So we have f of xy is equal to 4x uh, squared of y. Yep, no, y squared of x. My bad. And I'm at the point 0, 1. Um, uh, no, I'm at the 4, 1. Sorry, 4, 1. Okay. My goal now is in this problem, I'm going to do two things. I might have a second part to this. This, this first part I'm going to say is I'm going to find the directional derivative in the direction of, I'm going to go with 1, 1. Okay. My goal now is to find the directional derivative. This part A here, um, part 1, I'll even do, or I. I'm going to take my direction V to be one negative one. And I want to find the directional derivative in that direction, V. That's my goal. If you haven't done this problem yet, you can pause it here and, and go ahead and try to find the directional derivative of F in the direction of V at the point four one. Go ahead and try to do that if you're having some trouble. Pause this, because I'm gonna to start to do it now. So what I'm gonna do here is I know the directional derivative Right, the formula for directional derivatives, du of f, is equal to the gradient of f dotted with u. And I know for a fact that u has to be, this is pretty important, u has to be a unit vector. So we see here that my v here is not a unit vector. My direction that I'm going in is not a unit vector. We have to make it that. So in order to do that, we take our magnitude of v here. We see this is going to be just the square root of 2. Doing this out. We're going to then get here, we get my, my direction u then is just 1 over the square root of 2, negative 1 over the square root of 2. Something like that. So that's my direction I'm going in. The next thing I have to do is calculate the gradient at my point. So let's calculate the gradient first. The gradient of f, f is fx comma fy, right? Just like that. I take the derivative with respect to x. This is a gradient as a vector. Remind yourself, gradient is a vector fx, fy, I'm going to take my gradient. My gradient here with respect to x is going to be 4y over 2 square root of x. 4y over 2 square root of x. So this just comes out to be just a 2 on the top here, and this whole thing goes away. So I can just rewrite this as 2y over the square root of x. And then the derivative of respect to y is just 4 square root of x. Mm -mm 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 notation. And so now I'm going to calculate the gradient with respect at, at this point 4, 1. So the gradient at 4, 1 is going to now be, just plugging these guys in, this becomes a 2 divided by 2, so this is going to be a 1. And this becomes 4 times square root of 4, which is 2, 
which is going to be this eight. And so this is my gradient here. Okay. And so therefore, if I want to find the directional derivative of u with respect to a, 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 a directional derivative of f in the direction of u, I'm going to now find this at this point four one. It's just going to be the dot product between one eight and one over square root of two negative one over square root of two. So one eight. I can kind of pull out the one over square root of two if I want to. That's okay. I can move that all the way out. This then becomes one over the square root of two times um, the dot product of one times negative one, which is negative one. Eight times one, which is just eight. And so this is just negative seven over the square root of two, just positive seven over the square root of two. And so what does this imply then? What does this actually mean? This means that if I travel in the direction one negative one, one negative one, you can think about that as um, I'm going one in the x direction, negative one in the y, so it's like a negative pi over four angle. If I go in that direction, I start walking in the direction, and I'm at the point four one, start walking in that direction. What that means is my function height, my height, the rate of change, is going to be seven over the square root of two. Now, how fast is my function changing? And so lastly, what I want to do is kind of complete this exact problem, which says specifically, find the maximum rate of change at f at the given point, which is 4, 1, and the direction in which it goes in. So as a reminder, how do I, which direction is that? Which direction is that specifically? Well, I've kind of done a little bit of work here. But as a reminder, the direction that I must go in to have maximize my rate of change is, in fact, the gradient. Now again, how do I know that for a fact, right? How do I know that? I'm gonna leave this up here because I'm gonna need it. <laughs> but just as a reminder, my goal here is I wanna, let's say, let's say I wanna actually maximize, I'm actually gonna use black here. Okay, make this a little bit better. So if I wanna maximize this, I can go ahead and do this out a little bit more. And this becomes, uh, I can rewrite the stop product as the gradient of f, magnitude of u, times cosine of the angle between them, right? Angle between u and the gradient of f. u is, is a constant, right? So, so magnitude of u is the u is a unit vector, so that's one. So it becomes the gradient of f times cosine of theta. I have no control over the gradient of, of, of f. I can control what cosine of theta is. What is the biggest that cosine of theta can be? The biggest it can be, is one. When does that happen? That happens when theta is equal to zero. And then I would get the magnitude of the gradient of f. And what does theta being zero mean here? If theta is zero, that means that there's no angle between my unit vector and my gradient. So that means the unit vector, the direction the unit vector should be going in, is in fact the direction of the gradient. And so therefore, if I want to maximize my rate of change, the direction I need to travel in is in fact the gradient. And the magnitude of that, the, the actual rate of change going in that direction, is just the magnitude. I've proven it right here. It's just the magnitude of the gradient of f. So this means if I'm at the point 4, 1, I travel in the in direction 1, 8. So what does that really mean, right? What does that point mean? That point means here right, at 1, 8 like in that direction here. I have to travel in that direction at the point 4, 1. And if I do that, I will be traveling the fastest possible. And this is very, 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 very um, local. Right? It changes immediately as I move. Infinitesimally, it changes. So this looks kind of like I, I won't keep going in that direction unless there's a really, really weird kind of graph. Right? This is just I need to just point myself in that direction. And then I step and I reorient myself every time if I want to keep traveling the maximum direction here. So this direction right here is actually my maximum rate of change is one comma eight. And so therefore, to find my maximum rate of change, what is that maximal rate of change? I just calculate the magnitude of the gradient at four one, which is just the square root of one squared plus eight squared, which is with the square root of 65. I don't think that can be, yeah, that can be simplified. And so, if you are asked the question, what is the maximal rate of change at the point 4, 1, you say, ah, it's the square root of 65. That's how fast my function is going to be increasing. You ask yourself, okay, well, um, in which direction is that? That's at the point 1, 8.
That's the gradient at the direction 180. And so these are kind of the really big parts that we're going to need to know going forward, um, especially the gradient is really, really important too. As a reminder, and, and something I will always continue to hit home, the gradient and level curves are always orthogonal. So if you're on a level curve and I want to find the direction to where the gradient is, it is in the direction of maximal increase, which is in the direction that is orthogonal to my level curve. And that will do that. The level curve again is, is the point, is the direction where I will not change height, where du of f is zero. So yeah, that's basically it here. Um, yeah, I, I hope these problems at least help you kind of fundamentally kind of understand kind of these issues that we've been dealing with 14.4 to 14.6. As you can see, there's many different ways to go about it. Usually there's a couple key things you need to know. Um, so let me know if you have any other questions. And yeah, I hope you have a great day. And I don't think I even have a joke for you today. No, I don't. There's no jokes. No joke. I'm not fun. I'm not fun. So I hope you have a. I hope you have a good one. Do I have any jokes? I probably do. Do I have any here? No, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Oh yeah, speaking of my head, <laughs> that was me. <laughs> so it was a fun time. Okay, um, I will let you guys be. If you guys have any questions, let me know. And yeah, have a great day and keep fighting on.